Galileo Galilei adjusts the brass tube of his telescope. It's small, about 20 times magnification, crude by modern standards, but in 1610 it was the most powerful instrument of its kind in Europe. He steadies his hand and trains it on Jupiter, now high in the winter sky. Through the lens he sees something strange, four tiny points of light, in a line, close to the planet. He observes them again the next night. They've moved, not randomly, but around Jupiter. He keeps watching. Over several nights, Galileo charts their motion. Sometimes the points vanish, only to reappear, hidden, he realizes, behind the massive planet. Their movements are regular, predictable. The pattern is unmistakable. These are moons orbiting Jupiter, and with that, a key assumption of the old cosmology, that all celestial bodies revolve around Earth, was called into question. This wasn't just a new discovery, it marked the emergence of a new kind of science, one based on direct observation, precise measurement, and evidence that could be tested and verified. Copernicus had proposed a sun-centered model decades earlier, but it remained a mathematical hypothesis, largely untested. Galileo, by contrast, brought direct observational evidence to bear, turning theory into measurable reality. And by demonstrating that celestial bodies, like Jupiter's moons, could orbit around something other than Earth, Galileo directly challenged the geocentric model that had dominated Western thought for over a thousand years. It was a turning point. This moment would go on to help lay the foundations of modern physics, and Galileo himself would become known, as Einstein put it, as the father of modern science. Not just for what he saw, but for how he saw it, through observation, experimentation, and mathematical reasoning. But that same observation would also set his life on a collision course with the most powerful institution in Europe. Because if moons could orbit Jupiter, a planet other than Earth, then the long-standing belief that everything in the universe revolves around Earth was no longer tenable. And then the entire cosmic order, the church authority, and humanity's privileged place in creation were suddenly open to question. And questions like that, Galileo would soon learn, came with consequences. In March 1610, just two months after his first observations, Galileo published Siderius Nuncius, the Starry Messenger. It wasn't just a scientific report, it was a public announcement, and a challenge to centuries of accepted cosmology. Galileo described a moon with mountains, a Milky Way filled with stars, and four moons orbiting Jupiter. It was the first book of astronomy based on telescopic observation, and its message was unmistakable. The universe was not what we thought it was. We have a convincing and easy observation in proof that there are not only one center around which the celestial bodies revolve, as was believed until now. The galaxy is nothing else but a mass of innumerable stars planted together in clusters. He included sketches of the moon's surface, the positions of Jupiter's moons, and detailed descriptions of what he had seen. And just as importantly, Galileo named the four new moons the Medician stars, in honor of Cosimo de Medici, the powerful Grand Duke of Tuscany and head of one of Italy's most influential ruling families. It wasn't just a gesture of admiration, it was a calculated bid for patronage. In the 17th century, scholars depended on wealthy patrons to fund and defend their work, especially when it challenged authority. The move paid off. Within weeks, Galileo was appointed court philosopher and mathematician in Florence, placing him under the protection of one of the most powerful families in Europe. Galileo had risen from a relatively obscure professor in Padua to one of the most famous scientists in Europe. But fame came with attention and scrutiny. Many church officials were uneasy. It wasn't just Galileo's data, it was what he was suggesting that Copernicus had been right, that the earth moved, and that the old Ptolemaic system was wrong. Theologians argued that this contradicted scripture. Psalm 104 said the earth was fixed and immovable. 
Galileo wasn't just contradicting astronomers, he was challenging the literal interpretation of scripture itself. As Cardinal Bellarmine warned in 1615, To say that the sun is really fixed in the center of the heavens and the earth revolves very swiftly around it is a dangerous thing and would harm the holy faith if it were not well understood. Galileo tried to walk a careful line. He argued that scripture and science spoke different languages. The intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how heaven goes. I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. But increasingly, that wasn't enough. In 1616, the Catholic Church formally condemned the heliocentric model as heretical because it appeared to contradict scripture. Galileo was personally warned not to defend or promote the idea that the earth moves and the sun stands still, at least not as a physical fact. He obeyed, at least in public. For years, Galileo refrained from publishing openly on heliocentrism, but privately he remained convinced. Because for Galileo, the question was no longer about belief, it was about evidence. This is where his true legacy begins to take shape. He didn't just look through a telescope, he measured, tested and experimented. From dropping objects off towers to rolling balls down inclined planes, Galileo studied motion with a precision no one before him had attempted. He analyzed pendulums, mapped the acceleration of falling bodies and described projectile trajectories, laying the foundations for what would later become classical mechanics decades before Newton. He argued that nature could be understood through observation and mathematics, not through the repetition of ancient texts. And in doing so, he changed more than just astronomy. He transformed how we seek knowledge itself. By 1632, Galileo published Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, his most ambitious and provocative work. Framed as a conversation between three fictional characters, it explored the differences between the traditional Ptolemaic model and the Copernican system. Though framed as a neutral exchange, the dialogue heavily favored the Copernican model, both in reasoning and rhetorical strength, leaving little doubt about Galileo's true position. And readers noticed, and so did the church. One of the characters, Simplicio, who argued for the geocentric model, came across as stubborn, confused, and frequently ridiculed. Many readers and critics within the church saw him as a thinly veiled caricature of Pope Urban VIII, who had once been Galileo's ally. The Pope had permitted Galileo to write on the subject, as long as he treated heliocentrism as a hypothesis and gave equal weight to the traditional view. Feeling mocked and politically exposed, Pope Urban took it as a personal betrayal. What began with Galileo quietly looking through a telescope had grown into a confrontation over power, belief and authority, one that now threatened to consume him. In 1633, Galileo, aged 69, frail and nearly blind, was summoned to Rome by the Roman Inquisition. After decades of careful positioning, he was now at the center of a public and unforgiving confrontation with the most powerful institution in Europe. Over the course of several hearings, Galileo was questioned about his writings and beliefs. He was shown the instruments of torture, a clear signal of what defiance could cost. Under pressure, he recanted. Before a panel of cardinals, he formally denied that the earth moved around the sun publicly renouncing the very idea his work had helped bring to life. I, Galileo Galilei, son of the late Vincenzo Galilei Florentine, aged 70 years, being brought personally to judgment and kneeling before you most eminent and reverend lords cardinals, general inquisitors of the universal Christian Republic against heretical depravity, with a sincere heart and unfeigned faith, I abjure, curse, and detest the aforementioned errors and heresies, and generally every other error, heresy, and sect contrary to the Holy Church. He was sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life. His book was banned. He was silenced by decree. To many in power, his defeat was complete. 
but history doesn't always honor its victors. Though confined and aging, Galileo continued to write. His final work, discourses and mathematical demonstrations relating to two new sciences, a landmark in the study of motion and the strengths of materials, was completed in secret. Smuggled out of Italy and published in the Netherlands in 1638, it traveled far beyond the walls that confined him, reaching scholars across Europe, beyond the church's control. He never saw freedom again. Galileo died in 1642, still under house arrest, condemned by the church as vehemently suspect of heresy. But his ideas didn't die with him. They spread, quietly at first, passed from scholar to scholar. Within a few decades, the Copernican model gained ground, and by the end of the 17th century, it was no longer a radical idea. It was scientific consensus. The method Galileo championed, observation, measurement, testing, would go on to transform not just astronomy, but every field of knowledge. And in 1992, 359 years after his trial, the Vatican officially acknowledged that the Church had been wrong to condemn Galileo. Galileo's most significant contribution was not merely the discovery that Jupiter had moons or that the Earth moves around the Sun. It was his insistence that truth could be determined not by authority, but by observation, measurement and recent analysis. He demonstrated that nature could speak for itself if we learned how to listen through the tools of science. To look through a telescope for Galileo was not just to observe the cosmos, it was to confront inherited assumptions with empirical evidence. In this, his legacy extends far beyond astronomy. He helped lay the foundations of the modern scientific method, and with it, a way of thinking in which knowledge is earned through investigation, not handed down by authority. Galileo did not just shift our position in the cosmos, he transformed the very process by which we come to understand it.